Hey everyone, welcome back to episode 11 of Zero to CSWP. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the evaluation tools of assemblies and some modeling practices such as top-down, bottom-up, or hybrid assemblies. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be reminded of any future videos. And let's just jump right into SOLIDWORKS. First, let's look at bottom-up and top-down assembly modeling. Bottom-up assemblies are what you are probably most used to and what we've made so far where we make individual parts and then mate them together in an assembly file. In this scenario, making changes to one part will not affect the others, as parts do not reference each other, and that's why it's called bottom-up. You're making the individual parts at the bottom that eventually go to the top at the assembly. Top-down assemblies, or just a top-down methodology, is where parts in an assembly are defined based on other part geometry using external references. The main benefit of this is in larger assemblies, instead of having to change tens or even hundreds of part dimensions to allow for a general assembly modification, changing a main assembly component will have a domino effect and change all of the other part geometries along with it. First, we'll look at making a new part with this design methodology and then editing a subassembly initially modeled with a bottom up approach to incorporate some top down methodology. This type of modeling, where both bottom-up and top-down is used, is known as hybrid modeling and is a simple yet effective way to model assemblies. If we look at this assembly, 0 to CSWPD, which is an assembly representing part of a vice so far, there are two parts. One is this multi-body part representing the base of the vice and the static jaw, and then this part which would represent a block and a threaded hole so that the sliding jaw could move using a screw to thread through the threaded block. The part doesn't have an actual thread, as modeling threads in SOLIDWORKS is not always necessary considering you can use mates to define the movement. The sliding jaw is in another assembly which we'll add in later. Let's say we want to change the width of a vise. Since there are two different parts without external references to each other, changing the width of the base will not update the end block. We can confirm this by changing the width of our vise base in our feature manager tree and as we see, the end block does not update. Let's delete this part and make a new one to show using a top-down approach. The first thing we need to do is press the New Part button in the drop-down menu of the Insert Components button. Then we need to select a new face to create a new part on. In this case, we need to select the top face of our vise. Then in our sketch, we can just make a corner rectangle and define it so it is coincident to all of the edges of the top base. This external reference will make sure the size of the end block is always the same as the top of the base of our vise. We can extrude this and then add some chamfers and holes to the part so that it has the same design intent as the part we deleted. Now, if we try to edit the width of our vise, the end block updates along with it, which is what we wanted. Next, let's add in the assembly named E, which represents our sliding jaw. We can add a coincentric mate to the screw section and the end of the block. 
Remember that the threads are not modeled, but in real life you would need them for this to work. Then a parallel mate so that the sliding jaw is held in place relative to the assembly. And at this point our assembly could freely slide along the vise without any rotation of the screw, so let's add in a screw mate between the end block and the screw. So that moving our sliding jaw can only be done as long as the screw turns. We'll keep the movement at one revolution per inch. Now there's an issue. If we try to rotate our screw or move our sliding jaw, it says the assembly is fully defined. The reason it is defined is because our subassembly is rigid. A rigid subassembly pretty much means that instead of the subassembly using its own mates to calculate the position of its parts in the assembly, it takes the part orientations from the subassembly, fixes all the parts making it rigid, pretty much acting like a single part with no movement, and this means for us the screw cannot slide around in the hole of the sliding jaw as they are fixed relative to each other. And in addition, our parallel and coincentric mates in our assembly are causing it so the assembly is fully defined. To fix this, we need to make our subassembly flexible, which means the mates in the subassembly will carry over to the current assembly we're in, meaning our part will be able to move with a screw mate. To do this, simply select the subassembly in the Feature Manager Design Tree and select this button to make the subassembly flexible. Now our part can move up and down the vise with a screw movement due to it being flexible. If we want to add an external reference to our sliding jaw so it too will update, we can edit the base sketch of our sliding jaw part. Then we can delete the width dimension and replace it with a coincident mate to this fixed jaw of the base vise. I've done most of the heavy lifting here, making all the other dimensions related to this base extrusion so that they will update in the sliding jaw. If the base changes in our sliding jaw, so will the other features. And we can see changing our base vise width changes our sliding jaw width. You can get very detailed with this and have lots of external references, but for this video I thought to keep it simple with only dimensional changes. You can get very detailed with this and have lots of external references, but for this video I thought to keep it simple with only one dimension. Now let's go through how you're going to have to analyze your part for the CSWP exam. These will be real quick so be sure to stick around for the rest of the video as you need to know how to use these to answer almost every question on the CSWP exam. First, let's look at interference detection. This checks the assembly for any areas where two parts are interfering, which means their part volume is taking up the same space in the assembly. To do this, we can go to the Evaluate tab and select Interference Detection. In this selection box, the whole assembly is selected by default, meaning it checks for interferences in the whole assembly. But if we want to just check a few parts, we can clear this and select them. We can choose a few other options, such as treating Coincident as Interference, but you'll need to select these if the exam asks you. We can calculate our interferences and get the volume of each interference and as well see the area where it's happening highlighted in red. In an exam situation, you would give the volume of a specific interference as an answer. Let's delete the fillets in our sliding jaw to get rid of the issue and so that we can look at the other evaluation tools. In an exam, make sure you don't delete the feature that is causing the issue as they might want you to evaluate the part with the feature in it. Next, let's look at collision detection. The exam may ask you to move a part until it collides with either another specific part or just any other part in the assembly. To do this, we need to go to the Move Component button and then select Collision Detection and as well Stop at Collision. Then we can drag our part back until it collides with something. Let's say the exam wants us to find the center of mass of the part in this configuration. Then we can use the mass properties to find the center of mass. Before we do this though, let's see how to add a coordinate system into our assembly, which is basically just a reference point with three axes, much like the origin, with the difference that we can select where the coordinate system is placed. The exam will most likely ask you to add one or find the center of mass relative to one already added in. Let's add one by selecting it from the reference geometry drop-down menu. Then let's just select this point to add it and add in our axes by selecting lines of the part. We can flip the axes if need be.
we can go to the mask properties, override mask properties, select the override center mask, and replace the assembly coordinate system with the newly created coordinate system, and then we can get our answer. Lastly is the clearance detection, which allows us to select parts and see if there is enough of a specific clearance between them. Let's select the handle of our sliding jaw and the end block. We can specify a clearance that we want to check for, let's say 20 inches. Since there obviously isn't a clearance of 20 inches, it will notify us of this and let us know the actual clearance. This tool is very useful for very complex assemblies, and its true usefulness can't really be shown here. I bet you can understand for how things like maybe a watch, this could be a very useful tool. Thanks for watching episode 11 of Zero to CSWP. I really hope you learned something and that you're more familiar with assemblies inside of SOLIDWORKS. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited. Next episode is the last episode of the Zero to CSWP series, which means at that point, you'll be able to take the CSWP exam and hopefully pass. So stay tuned and I'll see you in that